Good afternoon, everyone. Um, of course, you're all here to hear more about this marvelously grand and ambitious book, Geopolitics and Democracy, uh, the Western Liberal Order from Foundation to Fracture. I am not Louisa Bialicevic. Um, she got sick, and so I'm stepping in as chair. I will not be telling you anything about the book, um, but I will tell you a little bit about its authors. We have Peter Trubovich, Professor of International Relations and Director of the Phelan US Center at the London School of Economics and Political Science. His main research interests are in international security and US foreign policy. And we have Brian Bagoon, Professor of International and Comparative Political Economy at the University of Amsterdam and co-director of the Amsterdam Center of European Studies. His main research interests are global economic integration, welfare states and democracy. They will be introducing the book for about 30 minutes and then we'll be having brief comments on the book by Ursula Daxeker, Professor of Democracy and Conflict at the Department of Political Science at the UVA, and Armin Hagverdian, Associate Professor of P Political Science at the UVA, and host of the Political Science podcast, Stuk Rood Vlees. For those of you who speak Dutch, do listen to the podcast, Stuk Rood Vlees. Um, so, um, Peter and Brian will be introducing the book for about 30 minutes. Then we'll have these brief comments by Ursula and Armin, and even briefer responses by Peter and Brian. And then you get the floor to ask some questions. Uh, Peter, do you want to come up? So welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, and thank you, Marlies. Uh, thank you, Marlies, especially for stepping in at the very last minute uh, for Louisa. Um, it's good to be here, and it's good for me to um, introduce the book. Um, the way we're going to do this is, uh, in a sense, tag team. Uh, uh, Peter will start with the substance. I'll take the middle, and he'll close us off. But before we get started with that summary of the book, I want to say something about its genesis. It's sort of an interesting uh, story in and of itself. So Peter and I both work on these topics. We've talked for many years about these topics. And it's fair to say that we've talked so many years that it's really the very beginning of my uh, life as a political scientist, because Peter was my bachelor thesis supervisor. Um, and you could say that um, this is a good news and bad news story for people who are at early stages in their career. The good news is that, yeah, you get to work with your supervisor and you get to write uh, nice uh, things together, including even books. The bad news is it takes 35 years or something <laughs> Before, before it shows up. Anyway, today's uh, story is partly the fruition of that effort. Um, and I'll say no more other than to ask Peter to get us uh, started. So I, I just want to begin by thanking the organizers for um, creating this opportunity to, to talk about this book that we've been working on for 35 years. Um, so... Uh, so the book is about um, what we call the Western-led um, liberal order uh, from the post-war era to uh, down pretty much to the present. And it's basically about why um, Western democracies' support for liberal internationalism was so much more robust um, during the Cold War uh, than it is today, and uh, how, where, and why um, things kind of went off track, astray, wrong. And our central claim in the book is that the answer has a lot to do with um, Western democracy's failure um, to keep, as you know, IR scholars sometimes put it, um, to keep international ends and means. Um, in balance or in equilibrium. Uh, in short, it's, it's really a story about Western overreach. Um, it's about how Western governments, um, international ambitions, essentially came to exceed what their um, domestic publics were willing to support. Now, this is not the story that we tell in the book that we kind of unpack 
is not a classic case of strategic overreach. It's the, the anti-globalism that we describe and track in the, in the book um, and that is roiling uh, the advanced democracies um, today is, is not a, a backlash against far-flung empires, against bloated military establishments, against endless wars uh, in the periphery, though clearly... Western governments were not immune to these excesses. The story has more to do with Western governments' increasing reliance on global markets and international institutions, especially supranational institutions, but the whole idea of institutionalized cooperation and the domestic resentment and the pushback that uh, it's basically fueled in one democracy after another. And we developed the argument in the book through an analysis of, um, of government, um, government policy, party platforms, and um, voter preferences in 24 Western democracies. And it spans essentially 70 years. Um, so from the post-war era down to the present. And what, what we'd like to do is highlight a few of the takeaways um, from the analysis, just to give you a feel for, um, I think, the overall argument, um, the scope. And I think where we'll try to end in these 30 minutes um, is, uh, and the scope of the challenge uh, that we face in trying to turn things around collectively. Um, and much of what we have to say in the book flows from um, a model of Western statecraft, though frankly this is not particular to the West, as you'll actually see in, in, uh, in a graph, in a figure in a moment, um, that we use to try to clarify um, the nature of the strategic debate uh, in the West over foreign policy. And it, it essentially combines two dimensions of foreign policy that are, um, I would say, rarely put together. One that scholars of international security stress, so investing in military power, the other one that IPE scholars emphasize, and we call these two dimensions power and partnership, and, and by power we mean military power, and the extent to which governments, parties, and voters favor investing in military capabilities. And by partnership we mean um, support for trade liberalization, international cooperation, multilateral governing arrangements like the EU and the WTO. And essentially what we argue is where governments and parties and voters, so all three, lie on these two dimensions of statecraft, tells us something about the relative weight that they attach to guns versus butter, so that would be like on the horizontal axis, and how willing they are to concede national autonomy or sovereignty, the vertical axis, to achieve other valued goals. And those goals can vary. They could, from access to larger markets and capital, to bolstering physical security through alliances, through NATO, uh, or uh, in, as well, neutralizing contentious domestic issues by moving them from essentially the national to the supranational level, to kicking them upstairs because they're too much trouble down below. And in the book, we show that these three cells comport with these four different kind of, if you will, ideal types or different strategies. Um, globalism, liberal internationalism, isolationism, and nationalism. You know, by globalism, we mean foreign policy strategies that really put a premium on international openness and international institutions. 
Liberal internationalists also see openness and international institutions as means for promoting a more stable, peaceful, and prosperous world. But we argue liberal internationalists also think that in a world of sovereign states, that is, in a world of anarchy, international order and peace also depends on the balance of power and the willingness to use military power to uphold it. And so that that distinguishes liberal internationalists from globalists are a key factor. Um, and in contrast to both globalism and liberal internationalism, um, you know, isolationists, for example, down here in the bottom, the bottom left uh, quadrant, um, you know, attach comparatively little weight to international openness, to international institutions, and they generally take a pretty dim view of investing in military power, seeing it both uh, in guns versus butter terms as a problem, but also very often, especially in the American context, they worry about it in terms of its risks, either its risks in terms of centralizing power in the state, uh, imperial ambition or military overexpansion. Nationalists share that same basic aversion to openness in international institutions, but unlike internationalists, they consider military power as a useful tool for guaranteeing security and welfare and favor, of course, greater national control over markets. So what we show is that during the Cold War, liberal internationalism was essentially a Western strategy. So this figure is based, the two indicators here, the, for power, we just took military spending as a percent of GDP. That would be like a standard indicator that scholars working in this particular domain, security policy, would uh, rely on. And then we use the KOF index of globalization policies, uh, focusing on things like uh, openness to trade, capital mobility, foreign investment, uh, you know, um, uh, support for multilateral uh, treaties and institutions. And so we created these two indexes and, and set the axes at the sample median for all of the countries uh, that are in, um, in the sample over this period running, uh, in this case, from 1970 up to uh, 2018. And as you can see, most Western democracies are in this upper right quadrant. And then, you know, you, you can see that down below, you probably can't see it from there, but perhaps not surprisingly, countries in the Middle East during this period in favor of investing very heavily in military power and far down to the right. But you see very few other countries that are essentially, they're below, most of the countries are below the horizontal axis. So our argument, or what we show in the book is, this pattern lasted until the 1990s when Western governments began to move and shift up towards the globalism quadrant. And at the same time that Western governments were moving up towards the globalism quadrant, voters in those same Western democracies began moving down below the horizontal axis, and especially increasingly towards the nationalist quadrant. And um, the next two slides kind of capture this movement. What we've done here is kind of broken it out or decomposed it uh, into what are in the book, in the narrative that we tell, the three main, if you will, political actors, the United States, the EU, we call it the EU 15 of all the uh, countries that are um, a part of the EU as of uh, the end of 1995. So the EU 15 does not include countries in Eastern Europe, although Central and Eastern Europe, although, um, uh, but as um, uh, the analysis here actually holds for them. We can talk a little bit more about that. And Japan. 
And what you can see, this is just the graph for Western governments on those, these two axes, is that they've all basically, if you can't see it, this, these arrows, like make it really clear, that they kind of, they all move towards globalism. So the United States also moves in that direction, although the U.S. is always throughout more willing to invest in military power than the European countries. And Japan, if Japan was anywhere other than this side of the vertical axis, we would have known there was a problem with the data. Um, although Japan now is up to spending about 2% of GDP on defense. But as you can see, Japan also moves up the vertical axis. And in fact, that is a big part of the story here, is Western governments are um, moving up the vertical axis, but at the same time, Western voters, and these are measures of voter support for both international partnership, trade liberalization, international institutions, and voter support for military power using party manifesto data, uh, platform, party platform data, uh, to construct indicators of, of voter support. Um, and, um, and what, it's a little harder to see. Japan is always rather difficult in the analysis here. But again, if you were to look at this, all of them, the United States is moving down in this direction from the early to mid-1990s. The EU, the same story. Japan gets there. It's just there's a lot of zigzagging in the case of Japan, but it moves down in this direction as well. This double movement, really, of governments moving up the vertical axis and voters moving down the vertical axis is a little easier to see in these three graphs here, broken out. These are exactly the same indicators, that is to say, on the left uh, vertical axis, it's the, that index of globalization policies. On the right, it's the party manifesto uh, index of voter support. And what you can see across all three of them, very clearly in the case of the EU, and I think in the, in the case of the United States, is that Western governments and their publics were largely in sync over foreign policies favoring greater economic integration and international cooperation during the Cold War. And if anything, there was a surplus, to borrow a phrase from Robert uh, Dahl at the time, there was a surplus of consensus. There was headroom, and essentially, room for governments to move up. But come the 1990s, things flip around and voter support begins to decline rather rapidly over the course of the 90s and the 2000s. You can see in the case of both the EU and the United States that it accelerates after 2008. It takes Japan a little while longer to get there, but they get there as well. Uh, by the uh, early 2000s, you can see that government support and voter support are really beginning to diverge. That, this is not to say government support clearly levels off in the 2000s, and it doesn't continue to climb as it did uh, in the earlier period. But voter support in the case of the EU countries and, and the US and eventually Japan, all of them begin to come down. Now, of course, this is a very, like, especially in the case of the EU, we're averaging here. But the general story holds when you break it down and you disaggregate across um, countries. So in each case, the story we think is the same, that Western governments basically got themselves too far over their skis. That the reliance on trade liberalization and multilateral governance came to exceed what voting publics were willing to support. And so the question that this begs, and this is really the puzzle for the book, is how the hell did this happen and why did it happen then? Why did it happen 
in the 1990s? Why did it begin then? And the short answer for that is that the Cold War ended. And what Brian's going to do, I think I've left enough time, is he is going to try to provide a slightly longer version of, of that story from um, both during the Cold War and after. There you go. So I guess I should go back. Yeah, or you could, yeah. Can you all hear me? Yeah. So indeed, um, I'm going to tell you a summary of a really uh, a multi-moving part story about why you see this gap and why you see this, um, in a sense, retreat uh, from at least from the point of view of, of what voters want, a retreat from this embrace of power and partnership, the, the features of liberal internationalism. And Peter and I have a, an explanation that focuses on domestic political economy combined with international security. And in that sense, we are trying as scholars of, of politics to bring together sort of two worlds that are often not brought together in our uh, sort of view of foreign policy statecraft um, the domestic and, 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 and the international. And our argument is also combining political economy questions, sort of uh, you know, the economic concerns and insecurities that people face within a country, and combine that with attention to security considerations, uh, the sense of threat that can pervade a polity and is important to political choices. So in that sense, the explanation that we give is this sort of marriage of security and economics, and a marriage of the domestic and the international. And it helps us understand this, this pattern that you see here. And the data that we gather in the study combines a lot of historical narrative, where we look at documents and speeches and what we basically read in our understanding of history. But there's a lot of quantitative information where we'll look at uh, the kind of government data that Peter already sketched, data about party positioning, uh, and data that are really trying to focus on voter positioning, uh, where we look at the voter support for parties and the platforms that parties embrace um, as a sense of the sort of three big actors in, in these politics, governments, parties, and voters. And when you bring that all together and try to ask yourself, why do we see that uh, sort of gap emerging? Um, and why do you see, more generally, uh, an embrace of liberal internationalism and then a tendency to uh, give up on that embrace it has to do with what you see summarized very roughly in the graph, the two graphs that you see on the screen here. Our argument is that the combination of social protection, a political economy characteristic, and an international security characteristic, global geopolitical threat for a given polity, come together to explain the embrace of liberal internationalism or yeah, the issuing of that liberal internationalism, right? So to the extent that you see substantial investments in social protection, for example, for the losers of economic openness and political openness, you'll see, um, uh, yeah, more support for that combination of power and partnership that we're looking at. That's what you see on the vertical axis for, axis for both of these uh, graphs is uh, an index of support for that combination of of power and partnership that Peter was summarizing before. And here we're looking at the government policies. So um, we're looking in a sense at the, the end game story that we tell. But we have similar graphs that say it's tell a similar story if you look at parties or if you look at um, these sort of proxies of voter positioning. In any event, you see that to the extent that there's more social protection, you do see a stronger embrace um, for a stronger embrace of liberal internationalism. And this is really summarizing just the descriptive statistics, but of course a lot of the data, a lot of the study in this book um, involves more careful analysis of, of, these, kinds of um, these kinds of information. What you see on the left is a spin on a quite familiar argument to people who study international political economy. It's an argument often phrased um, embedded liberalism this idea coined initially by John Gerard Ruggie in the 1980s, this idea that uh, an economic open world creates winners and losers. The losers need to be compensated. The state needs to embed that openness, that liberal, international, multilateral system in societies to protect the losers, 
make sure that the international system doesn't, in a sense, overstretch and uh, overrun the needs and abilities and, and limits, in a sense, of what can be born domestically. But the story that he was telling, and I think most people in IPE, International Political Economy, tell, focuses on economic openness and support for openness. And they see this positive relationship that you see here. So an embrace of social protection will buy more support for the liberal um, international system. And what we say is that that's not just an economic story. It's also a, a, a liberal international story. So it's not embedded liberalism. It's embedded liberal internationalism. The same kind of dynamic that we see that Ruggie was telling us about also extends to this more composite, encompassing conception of liberal internationalism. The more embedding, the more you have embedded liberalism, the more you actually see a support for this embedded liberal, uh, liberal internationalism. On the right-hand side, you see the geopolitical security side of our story, which, in a sense, abstracting from what you see in the left graph, um, tells us that, well, what happens is that if there's more Cold War-like geopolitical threats that a state faces, there's going to be also more willingness to support liberal internationalism. Okay? The measure of geopolitical threat index is a composite of five different um, databases that try to measure how insecure a state is in a given year. So insecurities looked at, are there militarized international disputes involved? Is there a border dispute taking place? Is there a war taking place on the borders of the country? Um, is the country itself at war? <laughs> These kinds of characteristics combined together tell us a sense of what that geopolitical th threat index is. This is averaging across all the country years in the study, right? Um, but what you see is that if you have more of such threat um, being experienced, you see a, a, a tighter embrace all other things being equal, a tighter embrace of liberal internationalism. And this is slightly more counterintuitive, right? It makes sense that third threats would inspire military spending. So that part of liberal internationalism makes sense. But it's not obvious that, that the threat, being exposed to a threat, would support a rally around the UN or multilateral institutions like the EU or the WTO. And the reason why we believe is a lot to do with the way in which um, yeah, the, the polities who felt threatened by the Cold War, so in the West that was being threatened by a particular sort of manifestation of Soviet communism, um, the way they actually saw it, it worthwhile to actually invest in a liberal governing system, the engagement with other countries and cooperative economic engagement that can support, um, yeah, that can support uh, the interests of the state. Okay, so our argument in a nutshell is saying that if you have these things come together, the investment in social protection for the losers of liberal internationalism, combined with, in a sense, being exposed to the threats of an international system, you can actually see this sort of rally around that combination of power and partnership. And our argument is that um, something really important happened after the 1990s where you see a significant decline in both of those conditions that undergird the embrace that we just uh, summarized. You see, on the one hand, a significant slowing down of investment in social protection. That slowing down is actually much more dramatic if you then try to normalize by the actual risks people face. So if you um, take into account the heightened risk of losing your job because of globalization or actual unemployment rates, you see a much lower um, level of social transfer protection after the 1990s um, uh, uh, than you know, in that 1970s uh, period that we started with. Right? And this is a reminder that that social protection is getting hollowed out or is getting weakened and therefore, um, in a sense, potentially undermining support for um, this liberal internationalism. And on the right-hand side, you see the end of the Cold War and a variety of other changes that took place um, it started out in the maturation of the Cold War in the 1960s, but you see it again after um, the 1980s and particularly the drop after 1994, where you see a significant drop in the average threat felt by uh, nation states. And if you look at the U.S., it's more dramatic in favor of the sort of story that we're telling. But the basic story is that you see geopolitical slack emerging with the end of the Cold War, and that has consequences for the willingness of voters, parties, parties, 
um, government elites to support this combination of liberal internationalism. And our argument in the end is that looking at how those consequences unfolded requires looking at what political parties were doing. What political parties did is they respond to these kinds of conditions, the social protection, the existing levels of economic openness, the levels of geopolitical threat, and so on. And parties respond to that because they anticipate what their voters want. But if you then look at what parties actually did by actually measuring their commitments to support for military preparedness, what you see on the horizontal axis, axis compared to what they committed themselves to in their party platforms with respect to support for partnerships, support for international um, uh, um, engagement, international institutions, trade, and so on, you get this picture. And the, and the picture shows that there's a really dramatic change that took place in the way the party system dealt with this combination of the geopolitical and the, uh, well, the, the power conditions and the, um, uh, and the, the uh, partnership kinds of international uh, partnership uh, characteristics. Um, you see that the radical right parties in particular really retreated from uh, a, continuing, a continuation of um, some kind of economic and political engagement with the international system. There was really a, t a move towards really quite dramatic nationalism. The radical left parties m modified or sort of moderated their anti-globalist stance on average. And kind of interestingly, the different families of parties that we associate with the center, social democratic parties, Christian democratic parties, um, center, left, center, right parties, they basically stayed the same clustering still within this liberal internationalist category. And our story is that this had enormous consequences for the strength of these parties that gave us a situation where there's this yawning gap between what parties are providing, what governments are providing on the one hand, and what voters really are rewarding on the other. So you see a situation where uh, the parties that are supporting liberal internationalism used to win at the ballot box, all other things being equal. Right? They would attract voters by virtue of that stance. But after the 1990s, after the Cold War, you see the opposite taking place. The embrace of liberal internationalism and the platforms of parties, parties that say, yeah, we want to continue with engaging these um, international institutions, international openness, etc., and we also want to maintain uh, political power with military preparedness. The parties that were saying those things found themselves losers at the ballot box. They saw a retreat of voters uh, um, from their position taking. And indeed, that means it was bad news for the mainstream parties, good news for the radical right parties, sort of mixed news, but not particularly great news for the radical left parties. And a figure that captures that dynamic is this significant rise in support for the radical right, significant drop in the mainstream parties. These are on two different axes, so I don't want to exaggerate. We don't want to exaggerate. We don't want to suggest that radical right are always so much bigger than mainstream, but the trends show this kind of dramatic divergence where we see the center not holding um, when it comes to the party political stances. This has implications for interna the international system that Peter and I um, look at in the book. The last section of the book says if you look at this big story and the, uh, yeah, the sort of gap between what governments are providing and what voters seem to want, it's not just a story about the lack of support for liberal internationalism in countries. Our claim is that if you then look at what the implications of that are for the international system, we see eroding support for the international system itself. Decreasing tendency for non-Western countries to vote with Western countries in the UN, for example. It's sort of a, a retreat from that kind of leadership in these international institutions like the UN. And on the right-hand side, we see a flattening or a sort of softening of embrace and support in different international organizations uh, for uh, yeah, um, uh, judicial autonomy and for a delegation of national sovereignty to these institutions. So it's bad news for all those things. And now I'm going to let Peter close us off by saying a few words about, <laughs> about what, uh, what we should do to, um, as it were, reverse this bad news story. We got the hand signal. We only have a couple minutes. I'm going to do this very quickly. Um, it's, it's mostly just to put these 
ideas out there so that maybe we can pick it up during the um, the the Q and A. Um, so basically, at the end of the book, the concluding chapter, we take up um, uh, three different ideas that are um, out there that are uh, that we think they're, they're already out there, but that are likely to dominate the coming debate over how to close the gap between these international ends and means. One of the options that's out there is for the West to simply retrench internationally, to rely less on global markets, to rely less on international efficiency, to put greater emphasis on global control, on control and global resilience. And we're already starting to see movement in that direction from immigration controls, of course, to industrial policy, to supply chain reshoring. There's a basically, there's a, a, a renewed emphasis on independence and resilience, resiliency, and call it what you want, retrenchment, protectionism, isolationism. This idea has gained a lot of traction in the United States in recent years. It's not only in the US, obviously, but it's clear there. There's a second approach, and it involves focusing on a common threat to deflect anti-globalist pressures at home and to restore a common sense of international purpose. And there are different versions of this argument that are out there also. Some point to climate change as, a, as the existential threat that could be used to mobilize or build consensus. Others focus on AI, and still others on labor outsiders, on immigration. The one that is getting the most traction, especially in Washington, is China. And simply put, the idea is to use great power confrontation with China to rekindle Western solidarity and domestic support for international engagement. Now, in the book, we argue that these first two approaches really won't get the job done, that the China threat is based on a false understanding or equivalence between China and the Soviet Union. There is a third strategy. It starts by reimagining the relationship between foreign and domestic policy, by looking for new ways to reconnect policies in the international realm to recognizable benefits for working families. We're not arguing, and we don't think, that Western democracies can kind of return to the post-war order, the moment of embedded liberalism when it took hold. But Western democracies can search for new ways to renew and update the spirit of the post-war commitment to economic security. And one of the things that we mention in the book, and actually what we're trying, what we want to push and develop further, is to rely less on kind of social transfers, although that needs to continue, but to invest more in inclusive regional growth strategies, domestic regional growth strategies in particular. In our view, that's the strategy, that's the approach that's got the greatest promise, but getting there is not going to be easy because it's going to require new arguments about the necessity of international openness, the importance of institutionalized cooperation, and new domestic bargains and political alliances to support them. At any rate, I think, I know we probably have gone a little over. I'm going to stop it there. We're going to turn it over to the discussants to tell you everything that's wrong with the book. And then we will open it up for discussion. Okay, excellent. Um, yes, so thanks a lot for the invitation to comment on what I really th think is an excellent book. I have heard Brian talk about many of the comparative and international political economy themes in this book, and it was really nice to see those come together in a single project. And on top of that, it was uh, wonderful that it was combined with Peter's perspective from security and foreign policy, and this integration of ideas from two scholars in different but adjacent fields, I thought, really made this a better book. 
So I'll start my reflections by highlighting some of the important contributions that this book makes, and then I'll also talk about some concerns and challenges. So in terms of contributions, the first contribution that this book makes is that it asks a big and important question that is also very timely. So the core argument, as we've heard, is that the international and the domestic really have to be understood together. And the book makes this specific for the Cold War period and its aftermath when it argues that this post-Cold War shift of political elites towards globalism without coinciding social protections really undermines support for the liberal order and democracy more broadly. And I think this helps us a lot understand a lot about the current moment. For example, the electoral success of the right-wing Freedom Party just two weeks ago in the Netherlands. And it is in fact also so timely that I could integrate it into a lecture on democratic backsliding I was just teaching yesterday to our second year students. Now this might not help your sales, but I did pitch the book. Uh, and it is a different kind of impact, I think. Now the second contribution of the book is that I think it's a model of theory building or good theory building uh, because a good theory to me uh, combines something about structural conditions with a theory of actors, their preferences and their behavior. Um, and so you start out with the structural shift which is the end of the Cold War and how this removed a disciplining effect on domestic politics but you then link it or explain how this affected various actors and how especially governments, parties, and voters responded to these changes. So it tells us why this is happening and also why it's happening now, as uh, Peter already mentioned. And then the third contribution of the book is that the empirical strategy, I think the empirical strategy is another important um, um, or prominent uh, contribution of the book. And what I appreciated is this combination of historical narrative of the changes that we've heard about with systematic quantitative data that is presented in a reader-friendly way. So there were lots of descriptive statistics and figures, but not a single regression plot, I believe, a regression table, I believe. And this makes the book really a pleasure to read. Um, and I also think it does what the best social science books try to do, is to aim to think like social scientists, but write like novelists. So good job. Um, so in short, I think you all should read the book if you haven't already. But this is an academic book launch where, oddly enough, critique is always part of the celebration. So I'll now move on to some of my concerns. And one is about the argument, and the other one is about some blind spots in the book. So first, in terms of challenges to the argument. So the primary structural factor that you identify in the book is the end of the Cold War and how it leads to a breakdown of this post-war compromise between elites and the people. But I wonder if the argument doesn't underestimate um, the effects of other structural changes that happened in the same period. So let me name a few. One, there were big shifts, which I know that you're aware of those shifts, but there were big shifts in economic production, such as the emergence of global supply chains and also the increased mobility of firms. Uh, this helped reduce or eliminate blue collar jobs in the West and happened alongside with the increasing mobility of capital. Then there were technological changes, such as the rise of computing and the internet, which then also started to replace some white collar jobs that were highly routine jobs. On top of that, these technological changes in information technology led to shifts in media landscapes, such as the decline of traditional media and the rise of social media, where everyone can be a producer and poor quality or even false information tends to be dominant. So therefore, I'm wondering if Elise's choice to underinvest in social protection wasn't so much of a strategic mistake rather than a response to increasing constraints on their actions. So the response that would have been needed to compensate the globalization losers and the response to these technological changes was perhaps not feasible, or at least I would like to hear your thoughts on this. Um, so yeah, I think this raises the question of whether global capitalism isn't in tension increasingly with democracy for structural reasons um, that you uh, uh, might be underestimating in the book. So there's a new book by Martin Wolf on the crisis of, uh, of capitalism and the Asumo Glu and Johnson book on technological changes and what this means for democracy. And, um, yeah, those are just uh, two that, that I've come across recently that, that perhaps emphasize structure more or different structures more than, than you do. And, um, I also think these structural changes could help explain some 
empirical irregularities that seem a bit difficult to combine with your book, such as that social democratic parties are seemingly punished at the polls, even when they make explicit offers for social protection, such as the Green Social Democratic Coalition in the most recent elections in the Netherlands. And maybe with that party, you would say, well, you know, they had a lot of globalist baggage because they had adopted some of these globalist ideologies. But even a party like the SP, the Socialist Party, was, was punished at the polls, and they never really backed away from their commitment to working class voters. And then a second irregularity that I think the argument has trouble explaining is the rise of ethno-nationalist parties in places that have also shifted towards internationalization or have adopted globalization, but where social protections were never strong in the first place. So Brazil and Bolsonaro, India, the rise of the Hindu nationalist BJP. Um, and this uh, uh, comment about India actually leads me to my second concern about some blind spots in the book. So I have two blind spots in mind. The first one is that you give us a story about the end of the Cold War and its effects on embedded liberalism in the West. But a lot of the world was not only excluded from this embedded liberalism, but their exclusion was seemingly necessary for the system to work because this was also a threat that helped unify the West. And this system, I would say, came with a tremendous cost for the people living in the communist bloc or, and also in the countries that we used to call the third world. What about their wants and needs? And couldn't we argue that the world today is better off because globalization seems to have reduced inequality between countries and lifted millions out of poverty in countries like China and India? And so if I wanted to be provocative, I could ask, isn't your story promoting Western nationalism in some way? And then the second blind spot is really about the role of voters in your argument. So you propose a shift from broad political buy-in and support for the liberal order across different social groups during the Cold War to now a much more fragmented landscape and elites that are increasingly disconnected from the people. But I wonder if most people ever really cared that much about liberal internationalism to begin with. And there's a huge literature suggesting that people don't care much about foreign policy at all. And also your measures of you know, people's preferences is fairly indirect. So this makes me wonder whether Fuller's story wouldn't have required you to say more about kind of the lines of conflict in society, cleavages in society, and how these are shifting from, let's say, markets versus states to now globalism versus nationalism. So this seemed a bit underdeveloped in the book. Um, maybe it's something for a next book that you may be writing. Um, let's hope it doesn't take 35 years. <laughs> So I'll stop here now. I really enjoyed reading this book, and I look forward to your response and also the discussion. Thank you. Good afternoon. Evening. Is it evening? Almost. Um, what a way to spend a Friday uh, evening um, here with all of you. Um, thanks for the invitation, Brian. I mean, when I was asked to give a few comments, um, to be honest, I didn't know why me because the liberal order and um, geopolitics and foreign policy are things that I've, I think, last really engaged with since my undergrad IR lectures. Um, I'm coming in from comparative politics. So I study elections and voting behavior. And, you know, but, but as you heard here, uh, uh, what Ursula was saying, the book ends with an account of voters and of parties. So as I was reading the book, um, I sort of I started as a student reading a text on IR and foreign policy regimes, and it became more and more a story about voters and about uh, cleavages in society and things like that. So I just want to go back to um, the typology. That's I mean that's a great way to suck me in in the introduction to present a two by two typology. Um, and as Peter mentioned, I mean, I, I hadn't come across anything like this typology before. Come on, yeah, there you go. Um, so you basically have your, 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 your hawks versus doves, and then there are some sort of institutionalized I don't know, partnership, um, regional integration, and so on and so forth. So 
the power of the typology, I think, is it provides you as a reader sort of a lens through which to see patterns in empirical regularity. So it's a backdrop against which you can place countries and nation states. You can place all sorts of political actors on those, you know, in those quadrants. And in the first few chapters, it's mainly nation states and countries and regions. And then it goes to parties. And that's where I sort of had a bit of an aha moment because it reminded me of some of the typologies that I've been seeing in my own research and in my own field of European integration. Um, I, I don't think that all of those quadrants are actually, that it's, it's like four quadrants being, being separated. I think it's a reverse horseshoe pattern if you look at it. Um, so let's go back to the one with the parties. To me, the big story there, but please tell me if I'm wrong, is you have a mainstream left and right who, like, look at it from the lens of European integration. Christian Democrats and Social Democrats have been the engines of European integration since the very start. And you can think about Adenauer and Kohl or, or Mitterrand. You can think about Dutch prime ministers like Lubbers and Koch. All of them were sort of great Europeans. And um, in the work of, of Hoog and Marx, but also Simon Hicks, his roll call voting in European Parliament, you see this sort of two by two. But there the horizontal axis is just your economic left-right axis. And the vertical one is whether you're pro or against European integration. And you get the exact same thing. You know, you have your left Eurosceptics, your, I mean, in the Netherlands, a long tradition of, of, of uh, Green Party and its predecessors, but you can think about people like, like Corbyn even in, in more recent times, communist parties, obviously. Um, and that's where sort of anti-Europeanism really came from much before the radical right took up that role. And then you kind of have your, your, your center, mainstream left and right, who are sort of centrist on economic issues, but they are very pro-European and also pro-partnership. And then you have your radical right. And the real story there of the radical right is that it adopted that particular stance relatively recently, in the 90s or something like that. So the question is, first question, um, is how do these two speak to each other? So is the real story that the European integration literature is just another expression of underlying geopolitical issues and fractures and fissures and everything else? Is it a pure coincidence that the two are related? I don't think they are. Is it really a question about military might or is it just your standard economic redistribution? thing that's going on, like, how do these speak to each other? And I don't think it's, it's just a semantical sort of story. I think it's important to understand, maybe both of them are expressions of something that is even deeper underlying our societies. But there's something there in that horseshoe pattern that resonated with me that, or maybe this is just another way of looking at that same problem or that same, I mean, matter, but then using an IR glass instead of a comparative politics. So what is going on here between, um, like, is it partnership and power? Or is it just your standard two-dimensional European uh, party system story that's going on? And related to that, oh, I should say, by the way, I, I echo all of, all of the compliments uh, that Ursula mentioned. <laughs> Is it too late? Oh, well, I might as well ask, by the way, Peter, now that you're here and you're his thesis supervisor, this 100-page appendix, did, did you teach him that? Because I've collaborated with Brian before. What, there's, so the book is obviously extremely dense uh, in, terms of its, in terms of its style, but there are so many footnotes and, and everything else. So if I glance over anything, please correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. But, um, so the second point I wanted to make is... Where's migration in all of this? Um, because I, so I, I'm sympathetic to the argument 
that there is a backlash, a working class backlash against Thatcherite and Reaganite policies and neoliberalism and that that caused a backlash against mainstream left and right. But as you show in the book, the radical right reaped the benefits, not the radical left. The radical left stayed constant over that entire time span. Why the radical right then and not the radical left? Which is sort of piggybacking on a point that Ursula also made. Um, Retrenchment of the welfare state and, and the destruction of uh, public goods and everything else um, should not automatically lead to a vote for the radical right, given that there's a perfectly viable uh, radical left in many of these countries. And I think the reason is, you mention it in passing, I think the reason is that the radical right couples these issues together with migration and identity issues. But migration is missing, I think, from the entire, from the overall argument. Um, whereas if you read you know, accounts like Crisis, globalization isn't just trade openness and it isn't just jobs moving. It isn't, that's not just, it's not just labor market competition. It's also a change in the um, demographic and cultural makeup of societies and, and a fierce backlash. And I think that's, it's difficult to reconcile the, what the point that Ursula made and also the one that I'm trying to make of if there's a perfectly reasonable radical left alternative for people that are fed up with mainstream left and right policies, why did they go to the radical right? I think that's, I think that's a, um, an issue that you have to, in some way, address. Um, lastly, the voter data, like I understand why you use the voter data. So these are not surveys. No, these are, the, the voter preferences are measured using the manifesto data coupled with how big the parties are. And that gives you a, a much longer time series because Many surveys don't have these types of questions, but some do. So I would be very interested to see whether or not the micro level foundations are actually the way they are. So is it true that vote choice for the radical right and the radical left, as opposed to the mainstream at the micro level, are caused by people's preferences towards defense spending, hawks versus doves, et cetera, et cetera? controlling for all sorts of other things that are there. So the micro level foundations, I think, um, are uh, an avenue for, further re for fu future research because using the voter data you have now, I don't think that you can get at that question. But I think it's an important one. In the end, when voters are in the voting boot and they cast their votes, do they think about geopolitics? Do they think about partnership and power and all that sort of stuff? Or does it completely drown, get it, does it get drowned out by other stuff? Um, I have other questions um, uh, which I'll, I'll maybe ask during dinner. But uh, it was a pleasure to read. I hope you all buy the book. Um, I, um, I look forward to the discussion, but thanks. So let's all come to the podium. Um, uh, Peter and Brian will get a very brief opportunity to answer these quite fundamental questions. So good luck with that. And after that, it will be your turn, your turn as an audience to ask some questions. Why don't you go first? Or would you prefer that I go No, I, I, you know, that's fine. Um, and of course, um, it's, that. it's your <laughs> privilege to pick and choose which of yeah. these points I'm gonna respond you want to pick to up. Uh, so these are, first of all, these are great comments, and um, and we could run out the clock here, uh, responding to all of them. I'm going to pick up two. Um, Ursula, your point about aren't we privileging Western nationalism? I think, and uh, Armin, your question about um, why do they turn to the radical right? So uh, these are great questions. So on the, on the Western nationalism, um, 
So I don't think we're arguing, but it's, of course, it's, you know, it depends on how readers view it. The, the point, I, I, I would like to think that the point is not that uh, globalization was, is all bad, let's say, for example, because it lifted, globalization lifted, we just take China, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And, but it's beyond China, it's sub-Saharan Africa, it's parts of Latin America, it's, you know, and throughout the global south. Our concern is, um, f first of all, we also don't take the position that globalization is inherently bad. So it's, the, the problem was not, is not globalization per se, it's the retrenchment and the contraction of economic security in Western democracies at the same time. So while you are expanding in the sense of globalization being expansion, you're contracting domestically. But it's also just kind of more fundamentally, I think, what we're trying to address is, I think, what went wrong or what happened inside Western democracies and why, why is it that there's been this kind of blowback and this resentment that what we, and what we argue is that, and that can be traced back, that you can see this beginning in the 1990s, far earlier. Most accounts, you know, I mean, a lot of accounts started with 2016 and Brexit and Donald Trump, and then there are those. I mean, a lot of the literature really focuses on 2008 and the implications. And both of those things matter. We see Trump and Brexit more as symptoms, and we think that the problem actually can be traced back to developments in the 1990s, and particularly the end of the Cold War. And so this is what I think we're doing, is we're introducing a consideration that really hasn't been part of the story. So a lot of people have written about the, uh, the end or the erosion of embedded liberalism. But they haven't focused on how the change in the geopolitical environment played itself out at both the party and the voter level, as well as the government level, which brings me to Armand's point about why the radical right. So I think what we show, partly empirically, but also in the narrative, is that the end of the Cold War did three really important things with respect to party politics in Western democracies. The first thing it did is it removed something that had made parties on the right, especially the far right, it's also true of parties on the far left, unelectable. Parties on the far left during the Cold War couldn't be elected because they were considered too soft on communism. Parties on the far right, they couldn't be elected because they were thought to be too crazy, too belligerent, that they might cook everybody's goose you know, with kind of the sword of, you know, Armageddon hanging over, uh, over Western democracies, not only, but Western democracies. The removal of that opened the political space that made it possible for parties on the far left, but on the far right, to give them scope. The second thing to say, it seems to me, is frankly, parties on the far right were clever, really clever. Because what they did when they saw the retrenchment or the beginning of the erosion of support for embedded liberalism is they switched their stripes. Most of those far-right parties, whether we're talking the Austria Freedom Party or we're talking France's National Front, were laissez-faire parties. And almost overnight, they switched and they stole the far left's thunder, basically, by embracing the welfare state. And they did more. They created a cocktail. And that cocktail was they combined it with concerns about labor outsiders, immigration. And that was so potent. I mean, it was picked up and, you know, it's really part of the foundation of Brexit, of putting those two ideas. Farage, in, you know, just embraced that ultimately. Trump 
as well picked up on it. Trump, people forget, he ran and he's running this time as a supporter of the welfare state. I'm not saying he did anything, but he knows that that is, along with immigration, is a combination that sells pretty well, maybe not, yet certainly, well, now we're seeing some t signs of it on the left, but very much on the right and increasingly in this, on the center right. The third thing I would say is, I said the right is cleverer. The end of the Cold War made it easier for center left politicians. You pick them, Bill Clinton, Tony Blair, Schroeder, Jospin, to move and ease away from the welfare state, to start talking about welfare reform. Why is that? Because the Cold War wasn't only an arms race. The Cold War was a welfare race between the East and the West. And, you know, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to steal this line, you know. Yeah, so as Eric Hobsbawm put it, Stalin may not have been very good for Russians, but he was damn good for Western workers. During the Cold War, if you were a political leader, you had to invest in the welfare state. You had to manage capitalism. It had to be managed openness. With the end of the Cold War, the foot could come off, you know, the, the break there. And it did. It was not, of course, it started on the center right with Thatcher and Reagan. But the thing is, is in the what makes the 90s really different is it's the period in the aftermath of the Cold War where the center left embraces the proposition. And that is the problem. So I think that it partly addresses why the far right has been winning at this game. In the interest of time, I'll... I'll Sorry, that was a long one. No, no, that was good, but it was uh, better than I would have uh, been able to do. So let me give just one uh, comment on one thing and preface that by also thanking both of you for your extraordinary comments and questions. And indeed, we'll talk about this uh, further, uh, point by point, indeed. Um, but I want to uh, take on at least one of the issues, which is about, in a sense, how the moving parts of our story, where you're looking at uh, you know, voters being interested or not, um, taking positions or not on issues of power, issues of partnership as we have conceptualized matters. The, the point made by, I think, both uh, Ursula and Armin is that, well, it's not obvious that if you enter the voter, voting booth, um, or for that matter, if in generally you talk to people on the street and they think about politics, it's not obvious that these things would really be driving their, their decisions. And for us, this matters also for the data that we were stuck with. Uh, um, and uh, I think the most important thing to say here is that, that we are aware of the salience issues, that there are all these other political issues that play a role. Um, our claim, our premise, and then ultimately a claim that's explored is that they matter at the margin. And you can make that premise because a lot of these issues do reach salience in certain points in politics, including at election time. And uh, in our in the quantitative analysis that we do, that was really the, the moment to be able to look at this explicitly by controlling for, for example, the positions that parties take on all these other issues, one at a time, or as sort of dummy variables, sort of controlling for the positions they take on, on, on cultural issues, the positions they take on, uh, on the welfare state, um, uh, and so on, uh, and see if that, um, if you, once you control away that kind of the story, if you still get the kind of patterns that, that we explored. And the answer is yes, you do see that. That was important to our, our interpretation. And, um, and in the end, that, that, the, the, the key thing to recognize is that even though there are all these structural forces to which these, these actors respond, so party leaders or, for that matter, voters, um, those structural conditions still leave a lot of room for choice, right? So it isn't true that, that the exigencies of economic globalization made it impossible to pursue social protection. That certainly was the rhetoric of a lot of political parties, a lot of political actors, but it really did represent a choice. You see so much variation in so many moments where there could have been more done, more compensatory provisions maintained or deepened, rather than sort of succumbing to the sort of demands of, I don't know, Goldman Sachs. Mm -hmm. 
um, that we believe that it still can be sort of seen as a choice. But that point you make is still well taken. I do believe that some actors were, were disciplined and fearful of, of that openness. Um, yeah, so again, thank you for the, the extraordinary comments and also for the, the, the nice things you say uh, about the book. Um, and now I'm, we, we look forward to hearing what, uh, what anyone else here has to ask. Is this working? Um, now it's your turn. We have a roving microphone. And um, please raise your hen hand. The only thing I would remind you of is that a question is one of those sentences that ends with your voice going up because you really want to know what these people have to say. And it's not an opportunity for long statements of your own. Now, maybe in the support of the thesis I uh, read in your story, uh, to repeat, um, you say that um, political elites overlooked uh, the interests of the voters over the last 20, 20 years. More or less, that is the main gist of your story. And I see there is some comment on that. Uh, and we are now going into all kinds of micro... Uh, reason, uh, reasoning about all this, uh, which makes it much more uh, difficult. I think you're right. I've been a lecturer of uh, the uh, World Trade Organization, or the, the, the work of the World Trade Organization, uh, for the uh, Klingendal Institute, uh, our Institute of International Relations, for about 15 years. And no, uh, I'm not did any original research, but just lecturing, but nowhere, no, no, any time during those years, had, did I found any concern about the backlash of globalization? It all was about uh, the World Trade Organization is the bureaucratic pinnacle of this whole idea of globalization. We should have as much free uh, trade as possible. Of course, there are some, uh, some impediments, but that is the way we should strive for. And whatever, because the economic uh, uh, ratio for that is really very strong, but we totally overlooked the losers in all this. People who got unemployed, people who saw their neighborhood changing. Nowhere did it come up in the discussion. And only with the Trump rise, it came up. Okay, so, so um, the I question think, at the so end of I there? I think that your remark is not right, and your remark is right. Is that, uh, can you give comment on that, please? Well, I, okay, before you start, let's see yeah. if we can uh, take a couple of questions. <laughs> yeah, so the lady in the purple sweater behind there. Thank you. Chair, it's Xiao Cheng Rui. Um, I'm not a theoretical person. So in your story, it contains a lot of zooms and uh, fancy formulas. So I respect you that you have worked 35 years on this. <laughs> I, I want to... Um, I uh, invite you to clarify the substance in your story. That is, you take certain very complex issues like uh, parties, democracies, as if a uh, very high generous uh, object, one voice, one decision. How can that help me to understand the ongo ongoing questions? Like in the US, just last week, the liberal uh, administration, Biden, announced to um, abolish governmental subsidies to all the VE, uh, EVs, uh, electronic vehicles that contain batteries produced in China. So you have very liberal parties making very unliberal, even I, I, uh, isolationist uh, claims. So how do we reconcile this, uh, this uh, um, attachment between reality and your stories? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let's have one more. And then you'll have oh, an opportunity to respond. Uh, the person there in the middle, yeah. Thank you. Um, interesting talk, first of all. Uh, my question pertains to the reasons for this erosion of the, the social uh, welfare, the social support. And I was wondering if that maybe or what, if you think that also comes from that same multilateral institutions, like the IMF that have um, with, uh, like the, the guardrails for European integration, for example, that they have um, like given uh, countries that wanted to uh, join Europe, or through the economic crisis of 2008, like the budget um, 
Yeah, like a budget cuts and stuff for social welfare. So you said it was a free choice, but maybe, yeah. Okay, so a question about the WTO that never seemed to care about the possibility of backlash. What do we do with your observations for understanding and maybe doing something about what is happening right now with isolationist tendencies um, and another kind of more European spin? Um, so let me take the, the two social policy points. So um, in a sense of debate, about the extent to which, uh, you know, um, uh, Western polities really were doing something to continue to support the losers and, and continuing social protection. And there's a debate about this, right? And it's not just between us and, say, Armin or, um, you know, particular actors. It, it's a major debate. And, and, of course, that's part of a broader question of under what circumstances do you see retrenchment of social protection um, what role do international institutions or international economic structural conditions play? So you're in a sense, you, but you both are talking about the same debate again. And whether you know it or not, the two questions on this were in opposite directions. And um, my own view, and uh, I think the view that we defend in the book, or we try to defend in the book, says, says that, of course, there are, there's plenty of variation, there's nuance to tell, to behold. There are um, conditions under which there is more or less room, more, more, more or fewer constraints that are posed by the international system. So right after the global economic crisis in the context of the sort of the Euro crisis, it's fair to say that there were constraints in some countries, like look at Greece or Portugal, uh, to, name, to name two countries, real constraints on you know, the extent to which you could actually use the fiscal purse to make a, a, you know, continued deepening investments in, in social protection. So these are always meaningful, these kinds of factors. But it's also true that um, you don't always have to fatten the fiscal footprint of the state to show and actually provide policies that address the needs of the vulnerable groupings. Sometimes that can be done in reforming the character or the terms of openness. You know, to what extent are labor standards, labor rights part of the terms of economic openness, political openness? Uh, what kinds of policies that are more regulatory in nature that address the, the, the needs of workers, access to certain kinds of benefits? Um, there are things that can be done that don't involve necessarily spending more or spending as much. Um, and I think uh, for us that continues to be, you know, uh, that's where the, the, there's always some agency in, in those choices. Um, but it's still well taken what both Ursula and Armin mentioned, that these are real constraints. Um, uh, in fact, I write about that in a lot of my other work, including work with with, with Armin, we've talked about it. Um, these, are, these are major issues in, in, in these policies. Where both of us were right. Where both of us were right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Um, why don't you take a crack at the... Yeah, okay. okay. I, I, because uh, Go ahead. the question isn't so much who's right or wrong. I yeah. think that's a very peculiar terminology to use uh, when you're talking about something that is this complicated and the story is so grand. I mean, but you know, those are your words. The nature, uh, so the question to me is, what is the nature of the backlash? Mm -hmm. And backlash against globalization has not been something new. Has been for decades and decades in, in, in my field of voter behavior. Um, people have been writing about this for, for way before Trump or Brexit or all of those sort of more mediagenic uh, expressions of the backlash against globalization. So in the literature on European integration, the question very much was whether or not, you know, Europe as an economic integration project that with each treaty became more integrated, um, whether or not, you know, Europe itself changed the terms of discussion towards a more political union. And once it became a more political union, that also coincides with the exact same time where pretty much this cultural backlash against Europe starts from the radical right. Now, it's very difficult in the type of research that we do to conclusively say, yes, that's the cause and that's the effect. Right. And none of us, we've been in this for way too long to use those types of words. So that's why I say it coincided. But the fact that for, that's a form of globalization or partnership, this changing nature of European integration, the question is, to me, 
what is, so is this about geopolitics mm -hmm. or is this about something else? Is this about political integration? Is it about economic integration? Is it about, so the Cold War, I think the stuff that, that Ursula mentioned, I think is very important. The Cold War ended and a lot of other things also happened, you know? So that's the way I would, I would sort of respond and maybe qualify your remark. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond to the China question, but also I appreciated the, the, uh, the, the comment about um, the WTO and so forth. No, not be because I didn't really view it of so much as, I mean, I don't think we actually disagree. We're, we're trying to figure out, and it is a, it's still a puzzle. Why has the right and the far right gotten so strong? And there's multiple factors. And, and Armin is right that in a way we strip out or, you know, the immigration part of that story to tell, to try to show that you can get there almost without it. Now, of course, we know in the narrative we factor it in and so forth. But the China question, and I take this mostly, I'm going to interpret it as a China like the U.S. and the China question. This is beyond the book. So, although related, I mean, so why have liberal politicians, kind of center, left, like a Joe Biden, why are they responding in ways that are increasingly nationalistic to China? I'll give you th three possible explanations, and they're not mutually exclusive. I mean, one that I think, I think all three of these are real and they're all going on at the same time. First, Biden is trying to make sure that he does not get outflanked. And basically, it's not just Biden. It, the center Democrats are trying to make sure that they do not get outflanked by Trump Republicans. And he wants to win back traditional Democratic voters who... One of the reasons they have left the party, it is not the only reason, is the China shock, is the effect that has been very well documented by economists at MIT, the erosion of districts, industry, um, in, uh, especially in the manufacturing belt and districts and states, beginning with China joining the WTO over the next decade to decade and a half. And this has really become a salient issue inside the party and in, in, in politics. Number two, I think Biden has seized on it, partly for the reasons that we suggest in scenario two going forward, to sell other things that can't be sold on their own merits. Climate. Doing something about the climate. I mean, it's tragic that it can't be sold on its own merits in American politics, but I think this is real. Number two, to be able to push through, for example, the infrastructure bill. If you look at the CHIPS Act, the infrastructure bill, the IRA, which is basically a climate bill, each one of those bills that was pushed through had a kind of China, China, China. You know, that China was a problem for the United States the U.S., you know, competitively. Third explanation. And this one I put on China. China's friends, I mean, China's neighbors in the hood, in the neighborhood, I spent a lot of time in the Asia Pacific, are nervous about China. And they are nervous about the United States. What they're nervous about is that the United States' commitment is incredible to their security or defense. You hear the same thing in Europe, of course, right? What if Trump comes back? What will that mean? So partly what is going on is trying to reassure America's allies. But I think part of that is a function of Xi Jinping's behavior in the region. So it's, it's, it's complicated, you know? I'm not saying the U.S. is an angel. It's not, and, it's, and Biden, I think, is exploiting it. And so partly you see this kind of behavior. There's multiple domestic and international factors that are driving it. 
Thank you. I think this exchange makes it even clearer how heroic your book is in, in combining international political economy and geopolitics. And now you're even more heroically trying to do that in your answers of a few minutes. I want to give the audience uh, one final chance to ask maybe one or two remaining questions. Um, the lady at the very back um, and this gentleman here in the blue jumper. So maybe you want to start with the lady over there. Hello. Um, thank you so much for this interesting talk and for your comments and also the audience's questions. It's been very informative. I wanted to touch um, on the topic of climate or the climate crisis as it pertains to um, economics and also to um, the trajectory that it seems that most governments versus the dissidents and voters are going. Um, there's been more and more so a narrative that climate economics isn't being taken seriously and it's actually more beneficial for most governments to veer or have policies towards um, addressing the climate crisis, not just for the environmental sustainability pillars, but also for economic sustainability and social cultural sustainability when it comes to human rights. I'd love to hear your comments of how you might think this um, would impact future um, allyship um, from the states and Southeast Asia and also Europe and Southeast Asia in particular, if you have any thoughts on that. Thank Any you. easy questions for you. <laughs> and Good finally, one. the gentleman over here. Yes, uh, the title of your book is uh, Geopolitics and Democracy. And when I look at your basic framework, I see a lot of the geopolitics, I mean the butter versus military power and the internationalism. But I was wondering where democracy comes into your analysis, apart from that you're talking, your cases are Western democratic countries, and that's where the action takes place. But does it also have an analytical value to understand these shifts of parties? I mean, so the, after all, if you think about Brexit, I mean, the way it was sold was taking back control, so it was mm -hmm. about democratic sovereignty. So maybe you can say something about that. Yeah. Um, I, I think I'll take the second question and I'll let you take the climate question. I'll, I'm, right. We'll see how I do it and I'll, and I'll be very brief. <laughs> so um, where the democracy comes in is fundamentally in this conception of what elites, political party, mainstream political party representatives and what they were selling to the polity and also what governments were enacting uh, when it comes to this combination of, of power and partnership. So that, on the one hand, what the elites were providing, the system was, was selling and providing. And on the other hand, what voters seem to want in a variety of data. And by the way, it's not just based on the proxy data that we use um, that Armin rightly pointed out is, is a sort of indirect measure. You can see a similar story in descriptive terms to what we show here if you do look at the existing public opinion data. So you do see this erosion of that, that support and a move towards that move downwards in the sort of two by two that you see on the screen still. So that's a democracy story. You have a, situ a situation where time and again, voters are expressing disdain for a particular kind of policy package that the system continues to sustain and tow and sell. It's true at the level of the parties, true at the level of policies. Um, you can see that actually as a democratic measure. We actually created that as a very rough measure of, of a democratic uh, deficit, so to speak. So um, that's where the democracy comes in. Our claim is that exactly that yawning gap, that what we call the solvency gap, that emerges, particularly after the Cold War, that's an expression of, of, of poor, sort of uneven, poor quality democracy. Um, there are much better ways of measuring this, and there are people in the room, like uh, Armin and, and, and Walter Schakel, who measure this better than uh, we do in this book. Um, but that is the, the democracy in our story. So the climate question, that's a, it's a big question, um, and, I, and I see we're out of time. <laughs> no, but so um, let me just say what my concern is, is that, you know, a few years ago when people would talk about academics, non-academics, about how climate 
was the vehicle for incentivizing institutionalized cooperation, to, you know, that you would get cooperation. What I worry about is that it is now, the, the problem is, is that the concern about climate is actually leading to rivalry and competition. To just go back to the question about EVs, like who's got lithium? And, and whatever comes after lithium, you know? And so that this idea of like a competition for resources. And so I think this is something, this goes to the second scenario where, I mean, you can think about climate as being a way to direct in a positive way, not only Western democracies, you know, and we include Asian democracies in our conception of the West. It's the global West, as people say, right? But I think, you know, what we have to be really on guard against now is the possibility that this is a vehicle for geopolitical competition. And, you know, and I mean, that's real politically and that, um, and I think as academics, we need to be focused on it, but I think there needs to be much more attention in the public space to this as well. I know, I, you know, the problem is I was trying to think how I could go there because normally I do, but that's all right. I do um, <laughs> want to uh, invite one final applause for the authors of this remarkable book. And to invite you all um, to have a drink at the back of the room. And if you want to, you can uh, co co corner and collar these two people and uh, ask them some more challenging questions. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.